Um, Adam, please. Thank you. Uh, it's um, I'm very flattered to be here. I'm delighted to be invited to an Atlantic Council program. And uh, I'm humbled to be among so many deeply experienced and wise um, co-panelists. Um, my task was to lay out the motives for um, the Russian intervention in Syria, and then to say a little bit something about what it means in terms of policy context for the United States. And I, um, in, the, in my paper, I basically lay out two sets of three motives. Um, a circle of three that I consider to be primary or strategic um, considerations, and then uh, three less important ancillary uh, motives, which uh, may or may not um, intertwine in interesting ways with, with the others. So the first circle of three, the, I think the least ambitious and the most obvious uh, Russian motive for the intervention in Syria, which a lot of this has been mentioned already in the first panel, that's the wages of not going first, is obviously there was an ally in trouble. Syria was in trouble. Um, the Assad, the wars uh, toed and froed over the last four and some years, but uh, as of last summer, as was mentioned in the first panel, uh, the Assad regime looked to be in real trouble in the north around Aleppo and Idlib, and uh, uh, the Russians don't have a lot of allies. Uh, the base at Tartus, the only base the Russians have outside of Russian Federation territory, and so um, it would look bad, and it would be bad for the Russians strategically if they lost really the only, the only ally they had in that part of the world, in which any part of the world. So, um, just like the United States intervened many years ago and to protect South Vietnam from being defeated, the Russians intervened to protect uh, the Assad regime from being overthrown. Uh, the second motive, again also alluded to earlier, is that the intervention puts Russia in the role of a kind of a kingmaker. I mean, they are there on the ground with an air base in Latakia province. They're there with tanks and airplanes and other military accoutrements. And they had become um, a much larger factor in any prospective settlement to the Syrian civil war and then what might be done uh, with respect to Daesh um, thereafter. Uh, the third motive, I think, which hasn't been mentioned, and this is highly speculative on my part. I have no hard evidence to back this up, but I think it's a logical um, inference that I think we need to at least consider. Uh, the, the Syrian regime over some four years or so, with frankly a not very impressive um, order of battle, managed to kill something like a quarter of a million people, mostly unarmed civilians, uh, to create something like four million refugees out of a population of about 24 million, and to create something like seven or eight internally displaced peoples, internal refugees. Uh, the Russians, if they wanted to, could uh, kill three times as many people and produce many, many, many more refugees than the regime already has. The point being to put a, a good deal of pressure on, um, on the European Union. The European Union has obviously had a great deal of difficulty coping with uh, 800,000 refugees, or less than a million. Imagine what, what it would do to Europe, uh, the, the, the tenor of European politics uh, if they had to deal with 3 million or 4 million. I don't have any evidence, again, as I say, that the Russian government, that Vladimir Putin is deliberately trying to exacerbate uh, and, and push to the right European politics. But uh, I wouldn't put it past him, and one of the reasons is because just like there are these three main strategic uh, rationales for Russian motives in, in um, in Syria, there are, I, th I also see a kind of like mushtruka dolls, you know, nested in, inside of one another. A same kind of scale motives in Ukraine. Uh, the first is just to create a rubble heap uh, so that Western ideas and institutions can't get closer to Moscow. The second would be to suborn or replace the uh, government in Kiev, which uh, is not to the liking of Vladimir Putin. But the third stretch goal, probably much too dangerous to attempt, would be to um, uh, send little green men into a Baltic state and watch what would happen uh, in the American, uh, the European, and the transatlantic response. If the United States and its allies uh, failed to respond in a vigorous way, that would be the end of NATO and of the American alliance system with it. So it, it's possible, in theory anyway, for the Russians to very grievously harm NATO uh, without actually meeting it on the field of battle, and visa the, uh, the increase in the, in the flow of asylum refugees into the European Union from Syria, it's possible to uh, put a great deal of pressure against the European Union without actually trying to uh, attack it or deal with it in a physical way. We've already seen uh, uh, the Italians a little, a little bit wobbly about the uh, um, uh, continuation of sanctions uh, against, uh, against Russia on, on account of Ukraine. So uh, these motives, although they are, as I said, they're speculative, they're not uh, unreasonable, and so I think they need to be kept in mind. Now, the three ancillary motives, uh, one of them has been mentioned a lot, which is uh, Putin's desire, uh, as a matter of course, 
to wrong foot the United States, to make Russia look like it's a great international power again. And of course, uh, as was mentioned before, this has uh, a lot of domestic political resonance. And I don't think we should underestimate the domestic political um, motivations for a lot of what the Russian government has done, not just in this particular instance, but over the past several years. Uh, you can track pretty much what the Russians do uh, abroad in various cases with difficulties that Putin perceives in the domestic realm. Uh, uh, but there are two other motives. I mentioned Ukraine. One of the motives, I think, is simply distraction, is to get people's minds off of Eastern Europe and Ukraine and to get it on the Levant. And this has worked wonderfully. It's been a very, very useful tactic. After the, uh, the uh, speeches that President Obama and President Putin gave at UNGA, you will recall that both the French and the Italian delegates at UNGA wished the Russians well in Syria, all right? Well, what kind of, what kind of selective amnesia do Western allies have to have to wish, to wish the Russians well in Syria and not say a word about what's going on in Ukraine. The third ancillary motive, and again, I'm not a Russia expert really. I don't, I, I would defer to Slava and to Pavel about, and to Angela about this subject. But it seems to me that one of the things that we've been witnessing is a kind of an international arms show, air show and with a ground addenda designed to uh, basically sell weapons. Uh, you know, the Russians had to eat an $8 billion bill when uh, the Ba'athi government in Iraq went down. The, the Syrians owe them about four and a half to five billion dollars. I think they're concerned about that. But more important, uh, the Russians have sold the Iranians the S-300 air defense system. That's expensive stuff. The Iranian conventional order of battle is rusting and basically useless. They are going to get something on the order of 100 to 125 billion dollars in cash. And one of the things they're going to do with that money is try to buy a conventional capacity. Where are they going to get it from? We're not going to sell it to them. Uh, uh, the only place they can really go is, is Russia. It's even possible that the Iraqis, the Iraqi government, will decide, if only for the cause of interoperability with Iran, also to purchase a new Russian uh, conventional uh, order of battle. And if you add up these numbers, I mean, you're talking about, you know, grocery money here. You're probably talking about looking out over a 10-year period, something more than 50 to 60 billion dollars. Now, that may not sound like a lot of money to the United States, but in Russia, which is deindustrialized, and the military-industrial complex being plugged into the oligarchy, that's politically powerful amounts of money. So, to me, those are the three, the two sets of three motives that I think, um, I think explain what the Russians are doing. Now, the problem, of course, it's easy to list motives. It's very easy to do this. The problem is to assign what the priorities are in the minds of the decision makers in Moscow, and then to assay how these various motives interact. Uh, and I don't have time to discuss that, but also, we don't have any hard evidence uh, about how that works. Uh, and again, I would defer to the Russia experts to, um, to counsel me on what they think the interaction and the priorities really are. Last comment. What does this mean for the United States? Uh, Dennis will talk about this in, at more length, but just let me say it very briefly. I mean, it seems to me that if you think about the problem in Syria and with uh, da Daesh long enough, you come to the following very simple syllogism. Number one, uh, Daesh is a problem. It's a threat. It's dangerous. How dangerous? People can argue, but after, after what's happened in the last couple of weeks, it's dangerous. And there's a lot of discomfort, it seems to me, that the policy right now that the United States is pursuing is uh, not adequate either in terms of its likely consequences or its, its urgency to, uh, to obviate the problem. Second part of the syllogism, okay, then you've got to uh, go after these guys on the ground. Air power alone doesn't work. Who is going to uh, supply these, these forces on the ground? Well, uh, there's been a change in the polls in the last couple of weeks. Uh, more Americans are willing now to send large numbers of American forces into the Middle East than I thought would be the case, and probably for the wrong reason, but that's irrelevant. But I don't think that President Obama uh, is persuaded that this is, the, this is the right thing to do. So we're looking also for reasons of not just political expediency, but political efficacy. We're looking for Sunni allies on the ground. They may be Arab, they may be Turkish. But as has already been pointed, I think Marquette's pointed this out, uh, ISIS is not anybody's first priority. It's there but everybody has a higher priority. It is therefore impossible to assemble a local coalition whose main target is the destruction of da Daesh. However, it is not impossible, in my view, to construct a coalition whose target is the Assad regime and with its Russian ally. And that brings us back to where we should start in the first place, which is that uh, the Assad regime is the problem. 
uh, in creating Daesh. The Russians are the problem in helping them, and the Iranians are the problem in helping them as well. So we come back to the real danger in the region, which is less uh, ISIS, which is a symptom uh, or an emanation of the problem, and the real problem is the Iranians, the Russians, with Hezbollah and the other, and the other militias. That's, that's the larger strategic problem, in my view. So this puts us right at loggerheads with what the Russians are trying to do in Syria, which is to sustain Bashar al-Assad, where our interest and the interest of the Sunni coalition should be to displace him, whether physically or by dint of retorking the battlefield so that diplomacy can produce the kind of outcome that we desire. Um, that's how I see it. Um, I, the last thing I'll say is this. You know, if the United States had decided three and a half, four years ago to create a humanitarian zone, my preference was that it, it be Turkish soldiers and with US and NATO backing, but of course no one paid any attention to me, obviously. Um, if we had done that, we'd have been there first. Uh, we would have, we, um, the opposition to the regime would have a chunk of real estate. Seriously. The third ancillary motive, and again, I'm not a Russia expert really. I don't, I, I would defer to Slava and to Pavel about, and to Angela about this subject. But it seems to me that one of the things that we've been witnessing is a kind of an international arms show, air show and with a ground addenda designed to uh, basically sell weapons. Uh, you know, the Russians had to eat an $8 billion bill when uh, the Baathi government in Iraq went down. The, the Syrians owe them about four and a half to five billion dollars. I think they're concerned about that. But more important, uh, the Russians have sold the Iranians the S-300 air defense system. That's expensive stuff. The Iranian conventional order of battle is rusting and basically useless. They are going to get something on the order of 100 to 125 billion dollars in cash. And one of the things they're going to do with that money is try to buy a conventional capacity. Where are they going to get it from? We're not going to sell it to them. Uh, uh, the only place they can really go is, is Russia. It's even possible that the Iraqis, the Iraqi government, will decide, if only for the cause of interoperability with Iran, also to purchase a new Russian uh, conventional uh, order of battle. And if you add up these numbers, I mean, you're talking about, you know, grocery money here. You're probably talking about, looking out over a 10-year period, something more than 50 to $60 billion. Now, that may not sound like a lot of money to the United States, but in Russia, which is deindustrialized, and the military-industrial complex being plugged into the oligarchy, that's politically powerful amounts of money. So, to me, those are the three, the two sets of three motives that I think, um, I think explain what the Russians are doing. Now, the problem, of course, it's easy to list motives. It's very easy to do this. The problem is to assign what the priorities are in the minds of the decision makers in Moscow, and then to assay how these various motives interact. Uh, and I don't have time to discuss that, but also, we don't have any hard evidence uh, about how that works. Uh, and again, I would defer to the Russia experts to, um, to counsel me on what they think the interaction and the priorities really are. Last comment. What does this mean for the United States? Uh, Dennis will talk about this in, at more length, but just let me say it very briefly. I mean, it seems to me that if you think about the problem in Syria and with uh, da Daesh long enough, you come to the following very simple syllogism. Number one, uh, Daesh is a problem. It's a threat. It's dangerous. How dangerous? People can argue, but after, after what's happened in the last couple of weeks, it's dangerous. And there's a lot of discomfort, it seems to me, that the policy right now that the United States is pursuing is uh, not adequate either in terms of its likely consequences or its, its urgency to, uh, to obviate the problem. Second part of the syllogism, okay, then you've got to uh, go after these guys on the ground. Air power alone doesn't work. Who is going to uh, supply these, these forces on the ground? Well, uh, there's been a change in the polls in the last couple of weeks. Uh, more Americans are willing now to send large numbers of American forces into the Middle East than I thought would be the case, and probably for the wrong reason, but that's irrelevant. But I don't think that President Obama uh, is persuaded that this is, the, this is the right thing to do. So we're looking also for reasons of not just political expediency, but political efficacy. We're looking for Sunni allies on the ground. They may be Arab, they may be Turkish. But as has already been pointed, I think Marquette's pointed this out, uh, ISIS is not anybody's first priority. It's there but everybody has a higher priority. It is therefore impossible to assemble a local coalition whose main target is the destruction of da Daesh. However, it is not impossible, in my view, to construct a coalition whose target is the Assad regime and with its Russian ally. And that brings us back to where we should start in the first place, which is that 
the Assad regime is the problem uh, in creating Daesh. The Russians are the problem in helping them, and the Iranians are the problem in helping them as well. So we come back to the real danger in the region, which is less uh, ISIS, which is a symptom uh, or an emanation of the problem. And the real problem is the Iranians, the Russians, and with Hezbollah and the other, and the other militias. That's, that's the larger strategic problem, in my view. So this puts us right at loggerheads with what the Russians are trying to do in Syria, which is to sustain Bashar al-Assad, where our interest and the interest of the Sunni coalition should be to displace him, whether physically or by dint of retorking the battlefield so that diplomacy can produce the kind of outcome that we desire. Um, that's how I see it. Um, I, the last thing I'll say is this. You know, if the United States had decided three and a half, four years ago to create a humanitarian zone, my preference was that it, it be Turkish soldiers and with US and NATO backing, but of course no one paid any attention to me, obviously. Um, if we had done that, we'd have been there first. Uh, we would have, we, um, the opposition to the regime would have a chunk of real estate, Syrian real estate, which against which to, in escrow, against which to trade for influence over a, a solution, political solution to the Syrian civil war. Now the Russians are there first. Now, suggestions that we create a no-fly zone or create or suggestions that we uh, bring standoff weapons uh, to attack the regime or degrade the regime or suggestions that we create a humanitarian keep-out zone run into the fact that the Russians are already there and therefore raises the possibility of either an inadvertent or not so inadvertent clash, direct clash between American and Russian forces in Syria. That's dangerous. Um, that's what comes from um, not using force judiciously at an earlier point in a crisis uh, and then allowing it to fester so that all one's solutions and all the risks get worse. I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful.